Welcome to Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. I am Ben Dietrich. Jordan Ridelli is on vacation. And Andrew Quo, stop me if you've heard this before, takes no days off. Andrew, how are you? I'm amazing. I'm trying to score some tacos for this Tuesday because last Tuesday I mistakenly said that it was the only day without its own vibe. I forgot about Taco Tuesday. LeBron James, best Taco Tuesday player of all time. So how can I get my hands on some delicious tacos? Um, I would assume there are still taco purveyors mm-hmm. plying their tortillas in your neck of the woods. Absolutely. You want me to look it up? We can, we can take some time and do a quick <laughs> Google search. You know, like, You've been doing this little craving thing when oh. they're at your doorstep, just go out there and get them, buddy. Well, you know, we don't have to talk about that again. But um, the tacos I'm, here I'm are... I'm just saying, I, I hate to see you in pain like this. <laughs> you want tacos, just go get them. The weird thing is... Uh, it's not safe. The weird thing is, uh, in my neck of the woods, in the Lower East Side, there are tacos to be eaten. But no delicious, like, notable taco. There's Taco Mix that recently opened on Delancey. Pretty good. Other than that, no, you just get like your midnight kind of um, Tex-Mex quick fix. Yeah, the one on on Essex Street doesn't really do it for me. Mm-mm. Not, not a huge fan of that one. Let's see, Barrio Chino, that sit down. Those are pretty good. I don't good. know. I know yeah. this is not the most engrossing <laughs> discussion of Lower East Side tacos. Yeah. Because I've not really thought about them, but I would. But, yeah, I would not say it is a a hotbed for them. Are there any f- trucks? Because like Williamsburg, Bushwick, and mm, maybe even like Fourteenth Street at some points, you can get like street tacos. Is that not an option in that, uh, down there? Okay, this is a this is a story about the worst part of me. But there's a taco truck on Avenue A right near Two uh, uh, B on second street yes and, yes i know that one and i used to go there i used to pop out after the games were done and go and get a taco and one time i tipped i bought like three tacos i think the total bill was like around 10 bucks and i tipped the person 20 dollars, and they didn't say thank you and it hurt my feelings so i have not been back since why did you tip them 20 bucks because I really liked them, and I felt like they worked. It was very cold that day. It was freezing. It was like in the middle of January. And uh, I thought they were kind of like doing the neighborhood a solid. So uh, the worst part of me is like I needed like I needed them to acknowledge me, which is dumb. But it hurt my feelings, so I never went back. Interesting. So it's a little like the episode where George is getting calzones for Steinbrenner and they don't see him put the tip into the jar so he reaches into the jar to like (laughs) put the tip in again and get spotted and then banned this was the opposite where they saw you didn't acknowledge it and you banned them it er, Larry David is obsessed with this thing that I'm also obsessed with and he can joke about it but I just think I behave poorly it's like Ted Danson and Anonymous right and Curb Your Enthusiasm um, I see a lot of on these GoFundMe pages that some people are anonymous, and I just want to find out who they are. I'm like, ooh, who dropped 500 anonymous? Who could this be? Uh, but there's no detective work to be done, Eames. Well, on those, <laughs> on, on those uh, GoFundMes, at least the organization knows who is being generous, even if the public at large does not. Oh, is that right? Oh, seems like something you would know if you'd been giving a lot on GoFundMe's. Hmm. I don't. I don't manage. I don't manage any of these, and I don't know who manages them. No, when they ask you if you want to be anonymous or not, you can say, um, you can use your name, 
or you can be anonymous, but it'll show up to whoever put the list together. And there's typically a couple people who are like listed on the li- on as the people you know behind the GoFundMe. That's odd. I haven't seen that. So they can hmm. see it even very, if you want to be. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I assume hmm. that they can't see it if you say anonymous. No, they can. Hmm. But just the owners or the creators of that specific GoFundMe. Oh, so, I thought it was even anonymous. Were you going to this taco truck regularly? This was your go-to taco truck. Not and really. And you banned it because they didn't offer you the proper gratitude, which... As a twenty dollar tip is very generous. It was too much, but I had been going there maybe like once every two weeks for a while. I mean, I knew them. I said hi to them. Um, even if, I don't know, I should have kept on going, but I also stopped craving you, them as do well. Do you think that they? Yeah, coincidence. Do you think that they saw it was a twenty? Oh, a lot of things could have happened. A lot. They could have been arguing with each other and not even paid attention and thought it was a one. So many things could have happened. That, I find like, it unlikely that someone who would say hello to you and work in that taco truck would see you put in a 20 as a tip and not acknowledge it intentionally. I find that to be a, a snub that is uncharacteristic of a local taco truck operator. Again, he could have been having a bad day. So I have no idea, you know? Um, but it was an option and is no longer my number one. I mean, I would certainly walk by and get another one if I was in the mood, but I and have not made it a destination since. I have not spent enough time in California to say I have a grasp of California quality tacos, but people who are or pride themselves on being taco aficionados from California or Texas Southern California in particular, well, I guess even even Northern California maybe, always shame the New York taco. I can't tell if we have good tacos or not because I don't have that breadth of experience. Although I will say they are not as good as the ones in Mexico City. Yeah, they have a point. Tacos are not great here, and I think New Yorkers... <laughs> she kind of concede that number one taco that chain that's in Chelsea Market now in Tribeca and I think there's one in Midtown those are incredible those are allegedly as good as any tacos in the world but other than that yeah I mean New York can take this L like we don't have amazing tacos here I don't get why that happens though it's the same way when people say well there's something about the water in New York City that makes the flour and the pizza different from other spots blah 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 whether that's true or not, I don't know. But there's no reason that people who come up here from Mexico would be making inferior tacos to the ones that they were making at home. Like, I, it just doesn't follow. I agree. Like, right. There has to be more than a handful of people who are like, I'm going to crush this. I know exactly how to do this. Water be damned. Um, but I think... I was thinking about this the other day because I was watching travel shows about street food in Asia. Mm-hmm. And like, there's places that sell one thing for like 30 cents in, you know, in U.S. money and in dollars. And we can't really have that in New York or America because like Bloomberg got rid of like the laws that make that possible. Right. So there's no food court that like has a stall that sells just like a funnel cake that you usually would assume you see at a carnival for like the cost of one funnel cake. It's usually like, well, now you can get like hot dogs here too and ice cream and popcorn and all those things because it's too expensive to have these establishments when you think about paying insurance and paying for sick leave and paying salary, taxes, all these things that are coming bubbling to the surface during this coronavirus zone, right? Um, that could be accurate. My theory on New York tacos being ostensibly lousy is that the vast majority of the Mexicans here are from Puebla and something like half a million of New York's Mexicans hail from that region of Mexico. So their cuisine is reflected here. Now, whether that means that they aren't able to get the same ingredients they would use at home, 
I don't know. It could also be, however, that the people who are coming from California are used to a different style of Mexican food. And Mexico City tacos are different, for example, than the ones from Puebla. So we might actually have a kind of a class thing going on as well. Because people from Puebla are generally like shorter and they don't have as much money and they are That's kind right. of viewed as bumpkins by people who are like from Mexico City. Right. So I wonder if there's a, a bit of a cultural disconnect where it's people's opinions on tacos have been shaped by being from Mexico City or being from California or being from those regions of Mexico and having kind of a built in scorn for Puebla. Oh man, yeah, this. this yeah, I went there. <laughs> no, this is a whole thing like that was happening in 2016 when racist people were talking about the country of Mexico as a singular thing. And I'm like, that's a very big country with lots of different people in it, like sort of like China being like the Chinese in Wuhan. I'm like, yo, China is huge. Someone from Wuhan versus someone from Hong Kong, like it's a, a world apart. So it's hard to just lump all like Mexican food together as one thing. Like, why don't we have a Mexican food in New York? I'm like, ooh, that's a very complicated. Like, from where? What style? At what price point? You know, uh, what community? Well, and if you go to Mexico City and you go to high end restaurants, if you discount the Americans who you will inevitably see there at this point, it has a very similar dynamic almost to restaurants here, where you have like Caucasian stock customers and people who are more indigenous looking like smaller, like Indian native American or Mexican American. Sure. What am I talking about? Let me make a note. <laughs> I say that. Yeah, yeah. If you go to Mexico, if you go to, oh, let me start one more time. Okay. I got you. If you go to a restaurant in Mexico city, you see the same dynamics that you see in New York city where European stock customers are at the tables and then the cooks and the wait staff are more indigenous people. And it's to your point, Mexico is not one, like it's not, it's not one singular entity. It has all the same class stratifications and even all like racial dynamics that you even have here. And, um, I just wonder if that plays into this taco conversation a little bit. For sure. I, I mean, everything's about like knowing stuff. Like if someone just watches the last five minutes of an exciting game, they, they can talk about those last five minutes and extrapolate the rest of the story from there. But they don't really know about it. And like, I am someone who is not fluent in Mexican food. I think it is the, the highest ceiling of all the foods that I've said before. Like, I think it is... It has the potential to be, for me, the best bite of food I've ever had in my life. And I don't know enough about it. So, you know, um, I don't know from where, what region uh, my food is originated from. And I don't really, you know, care. But I need to know more before I go out there and be like, this is the reason why there's no good tacos in New York, you know. Yeah, I don't even have a an opinion on whether the tacos are good or bad because I haven't had enough tacos in my life yeah. to consider myself an expert. But same deal with like, you know, with pizza. There was that, um, it was like a meme going around with different kinds of regional pizza. It'd be like St. Louis with a cracker crust or Chicago mm -hmm. deep dish sludge or mm -hmm. I don't know. They had ones like Detroit style deep dish. The fried, yeah. And people were sleeping on New Haven pizza, which I admittedly have one. never had. The best one. We got to get into the Cookies Mobile and go and have those delicious slices, man. It's clam slices, right? That's the oh. deal? Oh, my God. I think when I was there last year, I sent you a picture of what I was eating, which was a clam pie. It blew my damn mind, man. I was like, I mean, it's hard to shut me up, but mm. I was like just lost. I was like, I've never had pizza this good in my life. You were lost in its pies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the it, Ricky <laughs> Rubio of... Uh, but, um, Close yeah, enough. 
it's incredible because the the pie I had was like oh, I forgot the name of the spot. One of the, the the three that people wait in line an hour for, but it was a regular. It was chewy. It was buttery and fatty, and there was big clams on it, and there was awesome uh, uh, bacon. I got it with bacon, and it was one of the best things I've ever eaten. We there, it, there it is, cookies, loyalists. A strong <laughs> vouch from Andrew Quo, a pizza expert. Right, Don't right. sleep on the New Haven pie. Uh, but how is it different than the New York pie? Is it the, the dough? I have no idea. It I know that just it's, like a it, I know that it's closest to like a traditional like Italian New York City pizza. I don't like Neapolitan pizza, man. That stuff like with the soggy middle that you got to eat with a knife and fork, which is fine. I like eating. We can our politicians can eat pizza with a knife and fork. That's fine. But um, I don't enjoy the soggy middle with the bubbly uh, black pimples, uh, charred pimples from the brick oven. I think they taste good, but I do not enjoy the eating experience as much either. Mm. No, because like, yeah, it becomes almost like a. A mushy pit in the middle, yeah, and you and, and you can't really fold the slices because the ending is like wah, wah, yeah. <laughs> like you get a sad saxophone noise when you try to <laughs> fold those up. Yeah, and when you get delivery Neapolitan, it's just a disaster, man. Can't do it. Yeah, you can't even reclaim it because you can't like pick it up and put it in the scalding scalding hot oven. It just disintegrates in the box. Wow, that's like. They should have that at the garden when you walk in. It's like, and now you're starting small forward, R.J. Barrett. (laughs) Bobby Portis. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of disappointments, uh, did you get to the end of the plot against America and find out who was plotting and what happened to America? I sure did, man. It was right. incredible. I actually stayed awake for the last episode, but full disclosure, I was doing like other stuff, like searching for basketball shorts to wear in the summer online as I was watching this brown show. And I heard John Tuturo speak like he was from 1940. Mm-hmm. And it was... Kind of, it, it disappeared into the TV ether. It's just like the show kind of dissolved in a brown plot. Just a lot of burnt sienna, some, some umbers, mahogany tones, a light, maybe caramel complexion. <laughs> Something russet. It, there was a fight, no spoilers, there was a fight at the kitchen table. Mm. People broke it up, and the president of the United States echoed our current president and the poignancy was totally lost. And I know there's some people who really loved it, who thought it was nuanced and uh, maybe they grew up with childhood similar to that, like with kicking cans down the street and like some Robert De Niro beating people up in the grocery store stuff. But to me, it, it was an attempt at making some, uh, a commentary on our current political vibe and it just like we couldn't I didn't care about a single character I didn't remember a single conflict it just happened and as we discussed when this show first started airing the complications of making a nuanced reflection or an analog metaphor some sort of embodiment artistically of our current governmental situation in which we have a president who is like trying to outlaw immigration overall kind of falls a little flat when contrasted to reality like imagine america but slipping into a fascist state what would that be like you're like i'm sorry what oh oh yeah that'd be terrifying um i'm sorry the president's brown uh, banning brown people or something yeah yeah there had to have been more and there was a no spoilers there was a shocking scene in the last episode where you heard gunshots and i was like Oh, that's jarring. And then there was dead bodies on the street as people were talking. And it was meant to be this shockingly surreal scene. But 
based off of what we're going through in New York City, I'm like, oh, I've heard about these nursing homes in Brooklyn where bodies are just piling up. Like, this is like a tamer reflection of reality, which is pretty scary. <laughs> well, right. That book came out in 2004. The, the source material by uh, Philip Roth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you know, Bush presidency, you could look at ominous signals of America, the creeping surveillance state, etc. Yeah. But now, with 16 years since that, and the current resident in the White House, that sort of nuance doesn't quite hit different. Yeah. I know, right? Like, artwork from that time, like, are we going to get another Kurt Cobain? I'm like, <laughs> remember, like, Radiohead put out that record, Hail to the Thief, about Bush? And it was like, what? Like, how dare they? Um, now it just feels, like, really tame. And I don't know if that's social media or if it's tied in with the White House, but, like, people throw some heaters around where uh, scandalous artwork as even as recently as 2004, just seem like things we have already experienced. Uh, it what feels was, nostalgic. What were the Dixie Chicks villainized for? I don't remember them doing anything particularly major, but it was a thing that people were really mad at the Dixie Chicks. It was an ant. They were obviously anti-Bush, but I forgot there was one thing. Was it abortion? There was. I'm forgetting. Without Googling. I think it might have been anti-Iraq war. In general, yes. I just remember it being a national story that people were mad at the Dixie Chicks. And people say that was like the first example of a cultural cancellation where their fan base turned on them. And they at the time, it seemed, it'll probably seem a lot tamer than it was then. But um, they were successfully erased from like the, the country's zeitgeist, you know? I mean... R. Kelly did that to Aaron Hall. Yeah. Just erased him. <laughs> um, have you been watching any of these beat battles? Because I keep seeing Teddy Riley up there. I have not been tuning in to any more boomer battles on Twitter. Uh, the last one was, that was it for me. I'm Yes, yes. I'm just confused. I feel like there's been multiple like Teddy Riley ones. Yeah. Or Babyface. Babyface, yeah, there was technical difficulties with that one, and then there was a delay. Um, I enjoyed a lot of the jokes on there. There was a, a lot of cool memes, but after the premiere Rizzo one, I, I reached, I, I've had enough slices of pizza, and I'm good. I mean, I guess I would like to hear Babyface play songs from The Deal, mm-hmm. like two occasions. That's a jam. Jam. Get but some, like some joints. As, as you could predict, people were making fun of the sound and video quality <laughs> and the unpreparedness of participants. And I'm like, this all sounds like the horse tournament that the NBA put on that I probably... Are we going to see horse two? More horses? More horse? Probably I think not. that was established as a failure that will not be repeated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although it probably went viral and probably had more more viewers than the babyface battle, right? I don't know. I saw someone say like the babyface battle had like 500,000 people watching it or something. Well, that's could, a lot. Could that, could that be accurate? I don't know. That's a lot more than the RZA battle, but then you realize like how marginal DJ Premier actually is. I don't know. The beat battles are fine. Like, man, whatever people can do to, exactly. to kill time is, yeah. is great. Yeah, um, dude. I, I, as far as stuff I've been listening to, um, the Mike Dean album came out. It was called 420, so he decided to put it out mm. on, um, in spring, late April. Chicken or the egg over here. Mm, interesting. He's a big weed guy. <laughs> and uh, I like it a lot. Mm. It's just synthesizers. It's an hour and a half long. I don't yeah. think a drum hits until about 45 minutes in. <laughs> Do you have kind experience in this genre? No, not really. It reminded me kind of of, of Alice Coltrane Ashram mm-hmm. sessions, but through, and I, I had tweeted this, so if, I'm not really trying to repeat my own material here, but I feel like the <laughs> Dolby surround sound, like startup noise. 
It's like a very wow, like 2001, like apocalyptic synths, but yeah. very spacey. Uh, I don't know. I played it for probably two hours yesterday. Oh, and, awesome. And felt like mildly, mildly Martian. Yeah, man. Like I kind of left the surface of the earth and was in the cosmos for a little while while I was, you know, making barley on the stovetop or something. <laughs> yeah, barley boys. <laughs> uh, yeah, the record's Charles awesome. Charles Barley. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a super good record. It's long as hell as these kinds of records can be. And, um, you know, I only ask if you you have experience in this genre because, it you know, there's a precedent here. You know, Aphex Twin did a selected ambient works. Um, I want to say, like... Yeah, it e- might be totally derivative. I just do not no, know. No, it's I do. I just don't know the genre enough to say, oh, he's channeling this. I just know him. And for those who, who may not be familiar with the name Mike Dean, he's like a legendary... Producer, engineer, mixer, who's worked with guys like Kanye and Travis Scott and just sort of multi, you know, instrumentation maestro. Yeah. I mean, it's good. It's it's awesome. It's uh, recently I've been listening to a lot more s- soundtracks and specifically like the hit ones, right? Like the Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross uh, soundtracks for like the Social Network and David Fincher movies. And even recently, The Watchmen on HBO, I listened to that soundtrack a bit. And it has, like, kind of cool, vibey, scary uh, interludes mixed in with, like, like weird house music, you know? And I feel like my, uh, my brain has been going this way for a while, away from stories in music and lyrics into like the soundtrack for Interstellar as I'm shopping for groceries that night, you know? Um, it's very much the antithesis of the Fiona Apple album. Yeah, Which yeah. is all lyrics, all deftly changing tempos and quickly changing dynamics. And this is sort of the opposite. It's just very sparse. Every now and then a pulsing bass line will come in, then it'll just sort of fade out. It, mm-hmm. it's, it's the exact opposite. Yeah, and this is like I love this discussion because it's cookies relevant too, because more, th- more relevant, <laughs> more relevancy, uh, because when we switch to Spotify and away from record stores and shout out to other music, I want to see that documentary, and we started using streaming as a regular thing. Uh, I thought we were going to have more like subcategories of music where there would be like a huge ambient scene, like compact records would, would have their moment, you know, and it ends up accelerating the pop hits. And so uh, everyone getting easier access to music to me has accelerated like the perfect pop song, like Ed Sheeran, as opposed to, um, uh, a, a subcategory like William Bazinski, you know, who does like this this ambient exploration, um, and it, it might be just attention span. We don't have enough bandwidth to uh, consume all these things, but it is cool to hear something like the Mike Dean record pop up. I'm trying to sort out which generation this would apply to, whether it was a Gen X millennial schism, but where there was a a change from shunning pop music and popular culture and really making a beeline towards indie underground and and really treasuring those, I don't know, it could be rare vinyl, it could be be zines, etc. Just this idea of obscurity as a virtue unto itself has been really replaced by that idea of Beyonce. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Queen, big Kings. Queen. Like, yeah. you know, Bieber. The, the hating on an icon is frowned upon. And there's a scorn towards like the neck beard, like underground head. Mm. Was that a Gen X versus millennial thing? Is it older millennials versus younger millennials? It felt like there was a shift at some point where critics went from saying, okay, we don't bother with like the mainstream stuff, even on a pitchfork level, to suddenly saying, 
let's yeah. embrace the, yep. the the mainstream as being wonderful. And no judgment about that at all. Sometimes yep. the mainstream is wonderful, but it did yeah. seem like there was an attitude adjustment at some point. Yeah, it's really hard to pin down, right? Because when I say subcategories, like people trying to bring were trying to bring cassettes back, but it was an older generation trying to rehash uh, a vibe that young people really liked, you know, for a second. I don't think that's a real thing. And I kind of think of, like, our buddies Run the Jewels. You can just turn on your TV and hear that DJ Shadow song, you know? And uh, it's everywhere on HBO. They're using it for, like, three promos currently. And one would say that Run the Jewels came from the subcultures, like Definitive Jux. Um, LP has been navigating this territory his whole career. And now they're getting huge commercial success. But it's hard it's hard to find a really young person who's down for Run the Jewels. You know, it's usually people our age. It's also interesting that they've had more and more commercial sex sex. <laughs> Cops. <laughs> so <laughs> much, so much commercial sex they've had. <laughs> but when they've done Coachella and they've done you know they've been spot in national ad spots. Like for I forget which movie it was. Like Black Panther used their song in the trailer. Sure, sure. But their music is not any more accessible than the stuff he was doing on like end-to-end burners or, yeah. you know, his very first, you know, stuff in a group. I'm talking about LP. Yeah, Company Flow era. Um, yeah, it's hard to tell because... This is something I would love to, I always, every time I see a young person socially, I'm like, what are you listening to? And they're like, Aphex Twin. And I'm like, okay, that's what I used to listen to. That was like 35 years ago. What new stuff are you listening to? Do you like 6 9 And these are just the people I see. Like, I should go out to Ridgewood more. But a lot of the the dance music, I'm trying to, like, now Yeji is six years into her career you know and my favorite stuff that she did was kind of a wink to old house music so i'm having a tough time tough time pinpointing where music is going aside from like it all sounds great to me like this is the best year of music of all time and uh maybe the subculture subcategory thing is something i'm looking for but it does not matter i think part of it is just that the privilege of being able to find something that other people didn't have was really erased by the internet where you know when i would go and buy vinyl from like a one stop and buy these were like the only place where you could get the new rap singles and listen to like oh, this a new black moon song i mean fuck it that sounds good i'll buy it doubles and now every single person has access to it immediately and people gripe about this a lot, and I don't think it's a bad thing in the least. I think the democratization of media and platforms is great. There aren't as many gatekeepers, but so what? It's okay. But it does take away that sort of insular community around, okay, I'm a vinyl nerd. I can yeah. find this one record. You can do it with older stuff, but you can't do it with new music because it's there. Yeah. Like I guess you could order from Frank Ocean and hope you get it on vinyl only press in a couple months or something yeah but in general there's no way that new music isn't accessible to everybody at the same time immediately yeah and uh, yeah you're right because uh before before this we had culture as identity it's like are you into indie music or pop music are you a rap head or are you um a jazz head you know and that was a way for us to articulate like our personalities and i think now with identity politics like that's where identity politics comes in like do you go are you a warren person are you a bernie person are you a yang person and that's where we kind of like have our um discussions played out and that makes all the sense in the world to me because like you said like i think all of us can listen to the new Drake and listen to the Mike Dean and understand those pretty equally and expect our friend to have listened to those as well, because you could just like, Oh, just put it on your phone. Listen to it right now, you know? And, but we have a real, the way we were fractured as East coast, West coast rap 
in the 90s were doing with politics now, right? I think that's a, a reasonable comparison or sports. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, if you are a Republican at this point or a Democrat, you're not necessarily anticipating that either party is going to tangibly give you something. You're just rooting for a team. Yeah, You want wins and you want the other team to suffer. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when you sort of are losing the thread. And, and I'm saying this for, for both sides when people say, oh, I hope all these rubes who are out in front of, you know, the, uh, the, ju- you know, the justice building in Minnesota, I hope they all get corona. You're like, no. like, that's probably not good for anybody. Yeah, no. You know, not just them, but for anybody. That's, that's not a, a an, uh, there's not upside to yeah. a bunch of hayseeds yeah. getting, you know, corona and it being just desserts. God, can you imagine Schadenfreude for music in 2020 being like, was it bad? Was his new album bad? I knew it. Like, that just doesn't happen anymore. But in the 90s, that was kind of a thing. It's like, oh, my rapper put out a dud. And it's like, I, I knew it. He, he wasn't good. You know? It was a thing. It, oh, he dropped a brick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that album bricked. Like, we would look at the sales. Yeah. How to do. Ooh. Keith Murray thought he 50, had it. 50,000 first week. Brick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Ooh, you heard about cannabis? Yeah, he dropped a brick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Didn't go gold. Didn't chart. Yeah. That cannabis that, album, that was a brick. That was a brick. That was a brick. Can I bust? Um, <laughs> he went after Nas, right? And no, he, he, went after, he went after your guy, LL. Oh. It was LL Cannabis okay. Beef, and he put out Second Round Knockout. Which That's was right. which was a good record, and you had Mike Tyson doing the intro. A, a um, great idea at the time. Good, good record, strong. You know, it was just like ninety nine percent of your fans were high heels. Yeah, yeah. But he lost the war. <laughs> yes, yeah, he did. He did. Uh, Let me say that here <laughs> in two thousand twenty, <laughs> cannabis may have won the battle, but lost the war. Although, you know, he might be happy somewhere. He might be like Mace, like removed himself from the rap scene and Does that seem anything <laughs> like <laughs> cannabis? <laughs> I hope hey. he's happy. It just does not jibe with his personality. No, yeah. 20 seconds into most cannabis songs, you can kind of get a, uh, an idea of what kind of vibe he, what kind of headspace he inhabits, right? Jump out of the trees like Vietnamese. Who is the one who went... After Nas with that uh, That was label. Jay-Z. <laughs> no. No. The, uh, Cameron. Not Cormega. Somebody uh, marginal. Everybody. Cookie Hoops. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. That was Andrew Quo. I think he <laughs> dropped a, a couple vicious bars <laughs> against uh, Nasir Jones, a.k.a. Nasty Nods. <laughs> In your area. Nod, nod, nod. Um, well... On this topic of forced scarcity yeah, and the benefit of it, it presents a conundrum in the moment because the it last does. dance, which we discussed yesterday, we gobbled and has up. all of basketball Twitter and basketball fandom in a tizzy, a is being divvied out, as far as I know, over five weeks, maybe longer. I'm not sure if they're doing two episodes a week or only one. I don't know for sure. Yeah, is the last one going to be two hours? I don't know. No idea. But apparently, the, the entire series has leaked online. No, the leak. Which is very Nas. Which is very, <laughs> you know, like 90s hip-hop. Oh, the leak. Redo the album. It's leaked. The but Wayne. The leak seven. Seven more leaks. Are you gonna Are you going to download it and binge it and watch it? You love a good binge. Oh, I love a good binge. I I waited. I wait for things to end just so I can binge them. I will not be downloading this because I want to watch this with everybody. I don't care as much about this documentary as a thing, but I care about it as like something we can all experience together and make jokes about and like talk about. This is like a party, right? Like I could get dressed up, take a photo and have a cocktail and be like, well, I did all my party stuff. I want to go and hang out. I don't say this often, but I agree with you and you're right. (laughs) 
That's exactly how I feel about it. I don't really care what happens in episode six. No. Like, oh my God, did you see what happened? Like, Rodman wore a dress. Ewing got owned oh. again. <laughs> well, what happened? Like, what happened to Hubert Davis? <laughs> I, I don't really care. I will watch and enjoy those moments, but it is in the context of a communal event. So I hope that people resist the urge to watch it right away, or at least then rewatch it and, and engage in it. Because in the absence of actual games and actual things that are happening in real time, I thought it was a treat to have everyone gearing up to watch a show at 9 p.m. And considering that there aren't going to be new things made. Are there because... spoilers here? There's no spoiler that can happen, right? Not that I can think of, but also... Jordan was really hard on his team. But also, guys. we're not going to get new stuff for a while because Hollywood's shut down. And mm -hmm. there are movies that are probably in the can that might come out, but... As a basketball fan, this is kind of our only opportunity to like bide our time and have anticipation before so a, a, a you know ritualized Sunday event. Don't trade Starburst for your gum because gum lasts longer. It's the most valuable thing in your bag. Um, yellow Starburst, don't fall for it. But I think, I think taking our time with this is going to be worth it. It's going to be fun because we have enough to talk about in between Sunday and Sunday. Devouring it is, I mean, go for it if you want to have an awesome day, an awesome eight hours. But there are no spoilers, right? It's like, well, in episode seven, I can't wait for episode seven because Jordan is really actually hard on his teammates. But he wants the best out of them because he wants to win at all costs. I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, yeah. episode seven, he wants it more. Yeah, he just wants He just wants win. to win. Just winning, just constant winning. Even when he's losing, he's kind of winning. Because in every loss that he absorbs, it makes him closer in reality to being a bigger winner and eventually the ultimate winner. <laughs> That's, That's the real true. takeaway here, that right. Jordan's losses are just cobblestones on the footpath to winning. Which is kind of similar to the way I feel about this entire series, because I thought I think Jordan, there was, a, there was a story that came out that Jordan gave the green light to use this footage that he had been sitting on when in 2016 when LeBron beat the Warriors, maybe even that night <laughs> as LeBron was hoisting the trophy. I think it was that he would participate. I don't know if it was releasing footage or anything like that, but it was that he would be part of it. That mm. he would sit in his chair with his glass of Sincoro and his cigar. <laughs> I thought he doesn't drink. <laughs> I thought he was, he was better than that. At that time. Oh, okay, okay, right. But I think that he agreed to participate in it when he saw LeBron bring a chip back to Cleveland and said, uh oh. <laughs> That's that that people are gonna care about that one. <laughs> I better I better get to mythologizing. Yeah. And this documentary was made to prop up his mythology. Is it backfiring on him though? Like I don't we know, know too do you, much. Do you, do you right? think do you think it is? I do. Only because we have the opportunity to revisit all these games and all these stats and now we have more information that came after he retired. Or quit the the last time. Well, well, and, hold on, hold on, hold on. Give me an example, though, of what you mean. LeBron like, James we, exists. And of course, yes. But I just mean, okay, this is a a mythologizing opus for the greatness and will to win of Michael Jordan. What do we know so far, or what is backfiring about this project? I'm again, I'm I'm with you that like we know LeBron James is there and was better than him. Yes. But what's backfiring about the doc? The, I mean, not in, not in a literal sense, but if we're going to get 10 hours of Michael Jordan's last season, he has to kind of convince more people than he thinks that he's better than LeBron James. And we saw the first two hours, and so far, not so much, right? And, like, I say it's back... I mean, he's great. He, he, he establishes greatness in the first two hours. But 
I think it's backfiring him on him in the way that I think he was expecting some a reaction to be unanimous, and there's no way it can be unanimous. The fault is not in the object. The fault is in the conceit of it. To be fair, this wasn't his idea, as far as I can tell. It was, but he co-produced he, it, right? But he agreed to be in it, and yes, I mean he's involved. But this was apparently, according to this report that I think came out of the New York Times, that people were trying to do this because they had this footage, and he said, "Okay, fine, I'm in." After LeBron's heroics <laughs> against the Golden State Warriors. I don't know if this is hurting him because a lot of people who might be like in their 30s do not have that great of a idea of Jordan. They're just too young. And like these beat battles, when you're talking about babyface hit records, they're from so, 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 so long ago. Long ago. You know, Michael Jordan, they're playing, you know, LL Cool J, Rock the Bells, or I'm Bad, or whatever they were playing. That's like, what, 1986, 1987? The Maple Mamba had never even seen Kobe play. Like, time goes so fast, to your point. You know, 1990 was 30 years ago. Like, if you were 40 years old, you don't really remember Jordan dropping 63 on the Celtics unless you just happen to have been watching that game. Like, you don't really remember it if you're 40 years old. And we know memory's perfect, so we need people telling us about this. this So I I would say, in the defense of this documentary, for people who are under 40 years old to see, oh, he dropped 63 with bankers. (laughs) He had bankers. Against Rick Carlisle. He went up and shot over people in the paint bankers the only problem is you mentioned this that the footage itself seeing who he's playing against looks really old and they don't look that good at basketball because they're slow and they can't shoot and everyone's just standing around doing nothing no one has any muscles no one has muscles everyone's like getting angry and throwing punches and no one can like dunk except Jordan (laughs) (laughs) you know it's I like, mean, look, he does. He did not start the NBA, but he was the first man to jam. <laughs> yes, it's true. It's, A um, lot of people don't give him credit for that, but he actually was the first dunker in the NBA, or the what preceded the NBA. <laughs> um, That's I mean, why he's nicknamed Air Jordan <laughs> for yeah. catching flight and jamming. I mean, he's definitely more in the age bracket of 30 and below he's definitely more famous for his shoes which have even increased in popularity and the meme which kind of went away um he kind of ended the meme by addressing the meme right and or it just did what memes do yeah becomes not a meme it actually had pretty good endurance meme wise it was the number one meme i thought until he talked about it during kobe's uh, memorial and then we i just haven't seen it since but it could come back. Memes are like kind organisms. of shameless that he used Kobe's death as a way to exercise the phantom of that meme. I, I gotta be honest. I thought about that <laughs> when he was saying it. I was just like, "This is of interest to Jordan to create a better image of Jordan." So I was like, "Yeah, that's what everyone does during a memorial, right?" It's like I remember how I was amazing, and the person we're remembering was also amazing. Like in every wedding speech, there is, there are people who talk about themselves, basically, which is fine. I mean, this is what it is. But, um, and I think in this case with The Last Dance, right, it could not hurt Jordan because we're talking about Jordan. I just think he might, knowing how sensitive he is, he might be sitting in front of his assistant and be like, do they love me? It's like, yes, they do. It's like, have they forgotten about LeBron a little bit? And they're like, not really. There is a little debate. And he's like, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, look, it is a good opportunity if you're Jordan. Because you're like, oh, the season's canceled. Le- LeBron's might not be able to play anymore. And get that doc out there ASAP. Yeah. Drop it on him. The king is back. 
I mean, Jordan was not happy that LeBron went to the Lakers and then got AD. I bet you Michael Jordan was like, God damn it. I mean, not as a Charlotte Hornets owner related, as a legacy guy. Just being like, no, he's going to get more popular. <laughs> People did use that moment where Jordan was furious and betrayed about tanking to discuss his stewardship of the uh, Charlotte Hornets as well. Like, that- oh, the guy who doesn't believe in tanking. <laughs> his tenure with the Hornets has been remarkable. Um, it's uh, Nixian, maybe. But even just duller. It's not even as fun as the Knicks because there's no intrigue. It's like Nick Batum is our guy. I'm like, oh, you're not even going to try it at Carmelo? It's like, ah, we're going to trade for Rozier. And I'm like, oh, that's not that funny. You're just going to be bad again. I agree. I mean, they don't make smart moves. And they don't make interesting moves either. Yeah, there's no jokes. Like you, this, Kidd, this is something Chris. that will probably not surprise you. They were the team that initially drafted Tobias Harris. <laughs> Whoa, Net Zero himself, the God. <laughs> Guys, stop arguing and just enjoy each other's company. Sincerely, Tobias Harris. I, I gotta say you. though, man, that that Adam Morrison, you know, Sean May, they were they were going hard. <laughs> Adam Morrison was funny. That was funny. I thought I thought that was entertainment a little bit, but he was just so bad that it wasn't going to last. Um, and through this documentary, it kind of made me think about, like, you know, Michael Jordan is a jerk, right? Like, we can all agree to that. Uh, he's a successful jerk, and he, maybe he needs that motivation to be as, to have been as great as he was. Yeah, from a personal standpoint, he may respond himself to being a jerk and then needing to like live up to it that could just be self-motivating yeah and uh, to uh, to the most success like i mean not casey jones success levels not tommy hunt tommy heinson success levels not bill russell success levels not to the other jones on that team success levels but to his own and it's a ton of, of championships and it got me to thinking a little bit like he, he played into, I believe, his 40s with the Wizards, and he was still a jerk at that time. We don't see many old jerk players in the NBA because not all of them are Michael Jordan. Is the key to longevity vibes? Absolutely. Absolutely. When rebuilding teams add an old dude, it's almost always vibes. Like, oh, Vince Carter, he'll teach these young lads about professionalism and hard work. Oh, he seems like such a nice guy, though. Or like Louis Scola. Ah. You know, it might, it's either a Scully. tough guy. It could be a tough guy, a Taj. Okay, he's <laughs> tough. He, he'll show you what it's about to be a garden protector and like Marcus a face Morris, puncher. Yeah, Marcus Morris might be an old player in the NBA. I mean, technically speaking, he's kind of old, yeah. but not in the way of like the oh, old, j- old dudes. Like, old and toxic is rare. They might be guys who, like, are sticking around, who are on a long-term contract or something. Mm -hmm. But generally, you don't get those tacked on to the end of your career, you know, one-year deal, three million bucks, to be at the end of a bench on a rebuilding team or even sort of a rotational helper on a contender if you're old and toxic. And that degree of toxicity that we're talking about was the Jordan era, I believe. You know, like, there are grouchy players in the NBA still, for sure. But that kind of changed. Like, we got kind of lighter superstars when Shaq entered the picture, right? Kobe was the last toxic superstar. I mean, he played until he was old, but he was also Kobe. He was, you know, the face of a franchise. I think it's tough. Like, Ricky Davis's don't last for a long time <laughs> oh, i love ricky davis yeah exactly uh, I mean, but alan, he's alan iverson yeah. from all all accounts was actually a very good teammate in terms of people liking him and being a funny dude and, and enjoyable to be around but i think his the perception was that he wanted a larger role than 
he was capable of fulfilling at that stage in his career. And he found it almost impossible to get back in the league, despite the fact that he had put up really big numbers in his last year in Denver and was more or less out of the league within like three years. Yeah. And, and the story of Stefan Marbury is interesting too, because he was a grouchy guy who was dealing with a lot and he got expunged from the NBA and changed as a person in China. It took him a while and that story is well documented but he wasn't allowed to get old in the NBA, even though he probably could have been on many teams. He was good on the Knicks. Yeah, like I, one of his, I loved him. One of his, like, I want to say like he had a couple more years left where he was more mediocre, but he was really good for at least one year on the Knicks. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about Marbury and how he kind of, kind of got the shaft in terms oh, of yeah. being not only you know booted from the NBA, as you said, but his legacy as another guy like Iverson, who really did invent for a generation the volume scoring guard who is also your primary ball handler and distributor, it was those guys. It was Iverson and Marbury. And Iverson, of course, scored more and was a bigger star and had more career success. And Marbury, even in his playing days, was viewed as a guy who didn't really help his team win. Mm-hmm. But... Marbury has not gotten his due as an elite distributor scorer from the guard position as kind of an icon that led to the current generation of Westbrooks and Hardens and Lillards and Stephs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I, I do want to watch this Marbury documentary because he's just been on my mind as one of those guys from, you know, the mid-2000s that, we just kind of forgot about. Yeah. I love that you delivered that correct take as the thunder was raining down in the background. In your... Voice of God. It's amazing how the timing God approves, Ben. But, um, you know, it got me thinking a little bit, and this is kind of a dark thought, but we were talking yesterday about Jerry Krause, and they made fun of the way he looked. And I went to Wikipedia, and it says in Wikipedia that he retired from the Bulls position because of complications from obesity. And then we get this Kim Jong-un um, news last night that he is not feeling well. And he's a young man. I believe he's 36. And he had heart surgery. And I think it's documented that he's not healthy. When you see him, you're like, okay, you know, maybe he, he doesn't hit the gym. He, he's not a gym rat like like, <laughs> like you, Michael Jordan. Right, right. Um, and, in, you know, this is a dark thought, but like health, sometimes you can see health. And, you know, uh, I want everyone to live long lives and sometimes when you have when you have issues with that kind of stuff you don't you don't make it as far as somebody who may not have issues with that kind of stuff and this is all fixable and i'm rooting for everybody and but we don't see many people who look like jerry Krause very old right and I thought about this, and since this is a basketball podcast, I thought about this in terms of basketball. Like, we don't see many very old jerks in the NBA. We see very old, awesome dudes. Like, Rasheed Wallace was done playing by the time he went, was a Knicks legend, but he was just like a wonderful guy to have around. Yeah, and, I was going to say, I, I think his teammates loved him. Oh, loved him. Yeah, he was popular. Uh, always had his back. Latrell Sprewell had a few years left man (laughs) and i think he was pretty loved in new york by his teammates he was he was not religious but during the alan houston uh the god squad era your boy charlie ward and then he went to tim the timberwolves in minnesota and famously had the line like turned down millions of dollars and said i have to feed my family and he was it was a poorly stated thing but he deserved i think a, a little bit more money and um, he, he was out of the league, and he was like, I can still ball. How come no one wants to sign me? I'm like, you are not allowed to get old in the NBA because as a community, we don't like you that much. To that point, here are the oldest guys in the NBA right now. And let's see if they follow this theory that you've proposed. <laughs> Vince Carter. Good guy. Great. Love him. Udonis Haslam. King. People love him. Yeah, that, that's a legend in Like in Dade Miami. County King. He's been retired for like 25 years on the same team. If you told me 
he was on the same ones that had like PJ Brown and battled the Knicks. I'd be like, yeah, I guess. Sure. Like, I have no <laughs> idea when he entered Miami. It was the Twin Towers, Ronnie Sykley and Udonis Haslam. If you told me that, like, oh, shit, I guess you're right. Yeah, him and General Sherman. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, Udonis is in the club with the Knicks. He's, he's 39. Nice. He's the second oldest player in the NBA right now. He played 21 minutes this season. Shout out to Udonis Haslam. And I believe they're going to bring him back, right? Didn't they say they were going to bring him back just for a locker room vibe? Why not? They did that with Juwan Howard, too. Another one, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm just going to run off this list. We don't have to go one by one. Anybody who stands out as being potentially toxic and old. <laughs> Kyle Korver. Tyson uh, Chandler. Love him. Andre Iguodala. Great. Carmelo Anthony. Beloved by players. I think respected by players, definitely. He's, he's a legend to younger players. It was pressure from members of the Blazers that got him there. I don't think it was the front office saying, Mello's our guy. I think it was like Lillard and McCollum saying, mm-hmm. bring in Mello. Mm-hmm. J.J. Barrera is kind of a dick, but he might be. A, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if he's a dick in real life, but he's kind of a dick on the court. Yeah. But maybe he's like your dick. <laughs> you know, no, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, oh, that's your dick. I don't like him, but my dick, that's fine. Listen. It, it, that can be, be biological as well, whatever, however you want to phrase it, you know. He might not be a dick for you, but he's a dick for me. So lay off my dick. Exactly. <laughs> Get off my J.J. Beret dick. <laughs> yeah. um, and then you start getting into, like, Mark Gasol, LeBron James, J.J. Reddick. Hmm. Just leaves a man trapped in a cage in a Uber. That, that was a jerk move. The, <laughs> Like letting human trafficking go on on his watch, yeah, right under his nose. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's a, he's he's kind of dickish, but I don't think he's toxic though. No, no, I think people like him. Players go on his show. Um, if he was a little bit more of a jerk, he'd just be out of the league completely. I think he's getting away with having a very unique skill, and that he is an outlier shooter. There just aren't that many outlier shooters. Now that everyone can shoot, the value of the unitasker is at an all-time low. But Redick is still an outlier. He can really shoot. And this, I haven't looked at the stats, but this kind of supports our weird argument that old and toxic is a rare combination in the I NBA. I mean, he was shooting 45% from three this year. Good. Just, I mean, just crushing it. And when you, when you look at his, some of his more optically... Uh, obvious comps like Jimmer Fredette and Doug McDermott, both Knicks legends, um, they have not been given the opportunity to stay in the NBA, and they're struggling to find their way back. And to me, optically, they are outlier shooters. And, you know, people don't really believe in stats in the NBA. So, like, they maybe are toxic and young. I like this theory. Doug McBucket's toxic. They don't call him McFuckets for nothing, man. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to read off a bunch of names because yes, none, of these, none of these really go there until one. <laughs> uh, we got Thabo, LaMarcus, Trevor Ariza, Jared Dudley, Taj Gibson, Garden Protector. And here's the last name I'm going to read. Dwight Howard. Hmm. Known for being annoying. Renowned for yes. being an irritant. Yeah. Um. Kind of toxic. Kind of toxic, but in a different new way, right? Because the, <laughs> the knock on him was like he, he didn't have that Kobe uh, Mamba mentality, that Jordan killer instinct. He wasn't a sociopath. He got to the finals with Hidu Turkoglu, but he smiled a lot and like kind of was goofy and would clown around, and he didn't have any of that, that Eye of the Tiger stuff. Um, but not that well-loved in basketball communities, right? Absolutely. And I would always defend him from those critiques that you're talking about, which is he didn't want it enough. He was, you know, he was mentally weak and, you know, didn't live up to his billing in Los Angeles specifically. 
I don't know if all that's true. That all sounds like noise to me. He might kind of be an idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah totally. Like, no, no offense to him. <laughs> like, I don't know him, but he might be. When you hear stuff about him, it's like, oh, yeah, he farts all the time. Like, yeah, right, right. It's just right. like he just might be kind of a, a, like a dumbass. Maybe not, though, and I don't even mean it in, like, you know, he's like has trouble reading. I, I don't know anything about him intellectually. He might just be, like, a moron in the locker room. Like, stop being an idiot, man. You're annoying us. Uh, I'm not naming names here, but he crawled into one of my friend's DMs, like, mm-hmm. maybe last year, and stayed there. And they talk all the time now. And... I asked her if he was trying to holler and she was like at first but then we just became friends and we've just been friends for a year and a half now where he'll just be like how you feeling look at these funny shoes all right talk soon and she showed me all these dms and I'm like it seems like he just wants to be your friend and she was like yeah it's kind of awesome (laughs) and it made me really like him more obviously but you know and he was like I'm, I'm, i want to get into art can you tell me about that painting that you posted on your instagram who made it you know and he just came off as a really sweet dude yeah and again i it sounded like my voice was dripping with scorn when i was like He's, he could be an <laughs> no, idiot no. i more mean that like he might be an annoying dude to have around you in the locker room yeah. particularly when he is your best player yeah in yeah. the current context when he's a bit defanged by being further down the totem pole, he might act a bit different. Like he can still do some jokes, but he's not the, the king of the locker room when you've got LeBron there or Anthony Davis. Like the team doesn't revolve around Dwight Howard's fart humor. But in Orlando, it might have. Right. And like he might not be funny. He might think he's a lot funnier than he is. And that might make him toxic. I mean, but this, also, mm-hmm. I'm, that's not saying that he's a bad guy. That's no, not saying no. yeah, that yeah. he's uh doesn't want to get into art. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's art curious, and I think this goes back to our Peter Luger's discussion that we had forever ago. Uh, you got to be two of three things: uh, good at what you do, on time, or likable. And I think. Dwight Howard is still good at what he does for that price. And he's on time now, you know, like he's available. And the Lakers could pluck him off the free agent list for no money. Um, and depending on your taste, he, I don't think he's everyone for everybody in that locker room. And I wonder to that point, I wonder what the future holds for someone like Rudy Gobert, who is has misdirected anger you know uh, directed at him um and he's still an all-star for sure but when this contract is over and he's no longer an all-star maybe like our team's gonna balk at signing him because of this corona fiasco yeah i don't think so there might be a few but i doubt it but just going back to dwight for one second he certainly was toxic in houston there's no question about it he wanted the ball more he was not happy with the team employing an offense that right he wanted iso yeah he wanted to post up he wanted more field goal attempts he didn't want to just set picks and roll to the basket and catch lobs he was uninterested in that being his role with the rockets he opted out of his contract and then they started using clint capella exactly how they wanted to use him and and dwight was good enough at the time to dictate those terms yeah and apparently he went in to daryl morey and said I remember this being a a rumor, a report at the time, and he said, I want to post up more. And Maury said, here is what you score on post possessions. We're not going to do that. And then he opted out of his contract. He's like, you are scoring, I don't know, whatever, you know, 93 points per possession or, you know, 0.93 points per possession on a post up. We score as a team 108. We're not giving you the ball to do that. And he's like, all right, I'm out. Yeah. But um, speaking of toxic players, what about Ben <laughs> Simmons? That guy is toxic. I mean, if he's not helping, if he's dating 
a, a celebrity, if he's obsessed with dating celebrities and not keeping defense is honest, can we call him anything other than toxic? I mean, he's been helping raise money for, you know, Australian wildfires and stuff, but like work on your jumper, you know, like focus on the three ball, that corner three, dude. No matter how much money he raises for the local Philadelphia community, he's still a coward for not taking three pointers, not breaking more three pointers in games. So the reason we're bringing up Ben Simmons is that he was the subject actually of two articles today. One on The Ringer, but one that was longer and a more in-depth profile by the grand matriarch of the Boston media mafia, Jackie McMullen. And The Ringer article, also a a, a BMM production. Interesting. Two Celtics uh, enthusiasts dropping Ben Simmons articles on the same day. Ben Simmons just with real estate mansions in Boston. Just a time to be alive. (laughs) But the Jackie McMullen article is it's not critical. It's not the typical BMM drivel, but it, of course, latches onto his lack of a three-pointer and talks about it for, I don't know, 70% of the article, which I found weird because it's a really boring subject. And the article didn't even get into whether it actually would help him or not. In fact, it includes a quote from, I want to say it was a a Western Conference GM or scout or someone saying that they would not guard him if he took threes the same way they don't guard Giannis and they're super happy when Giannis takes threes. Yeah. So the article was interesting. It, 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 right in the middle of it, it acknowledges that him shooting threes at a mediocre clip wouldn't do shit for the Sixers, wouldn't give them spacing, wouldn't mean that the defense adjusted or was forthright or sincere. And yet the article keeps on going and owing and going and going, discussing, is it a lack of confidence? Let's ask his his siblings. Let's ask his coach. And I don't really get it. I still do not understand the singular obsession over Ben Simmons' jump shot when we are in a league with Players like Bam Adebayo, Zion Williamson, Giannis, a functional total non-shooter, Gobert, Trez. Westbrook can't shoot for shit. The idea that Simmons is... Trey Young is kind of a dubious shooter. (laughs) But the idea that Ben Simmons is a total anomaly as a non-shooter just is not true. It's just completely untrue. There are a bunch of really good players. In fact, many of the best players in the league who are functional non-shooters. It it just seems to me strange that this article came out a deep dive on his jumper following a month in January where he averaged 22... One sec, one sec, one sec. January, Ben Simmons, (laughs) with, with Joel Embiid out, basically made the entire league eat shit. Just shut their fucking mouths. Put up 22.2, 9.4 boards, 7.7 assists on a 62.6 field goal percentage and a true shooting percentage of 65%. Like, he just destroyed the league. Yeah. And now we're like, back to the jumper. I don't get it. Don't get it, Andrew Quo. I just don't get it. <laughs> I mean, all those stats, you brought the facts, and I agree. I got them on deck. <laughs> they're right. They're right. They're right here. I had to, I had to find them, but they're right here. Where's the thunder now? Uh, um, but <laughs> I think it's a really awkward time to be a sports journalist, especially a journalist like a beat no, journalist. No, 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 no. You're not getting. You're not letting them off the hook. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm saying this article uh, was definitely was the job. one that we heard about prior to coronavirus when we were even talking about like Jackie McMullen is in the Sixers locker room like oh here we go but this this is my point right like we there was rumblings that she was around and the other people in the room were like here comes another hit piece by Jackie McMullen you know she's sniffing around Ben Simmons and she certainly isn't going to write the piece being like guys he's actually smarter than every other player on the court by doing smart things on the court and avoiding the things he doesn't do well. He is an evolved player. She's not going to write that article. Um, But 
you know, this no com- disrespect to her at all. And and my thing is that we've heard so much about it. Why not make that ten percent of the article? Why not make that your lead? So Simmons this- won't shoot. He won't shoot. And then be like, how about we just talk about all the other stuff? Why he doesn't need to shoot? How we put up. 22.2, 9.4, 7.7. It was 9.9. I can't read my own handwriting. But that this guy put up these gargantuan numbers without a jumper, and here's how. Here's how they have to use him because of his lack of a jumper. Here's the kind of guys you can't put him on the floor with. What do you do when you have a star who can't shoot? How does it change your strategy? Those are all interesting things. What do you do when you're a journalist with no games to watch? What is your strategy to put out this article? This article was going to happen eventually, right? Because it's the yeah. only thing that gets us fired up. And we're talking about it now. We're pro Ben Simmons. But even those start bench cut uh, uh, memes, I guess, on Twitter, as soon as you put Simmons on there, it's like, it's like rapid fire people being like well you can't start someone who doesn't know how to shoot and won't shoot so he's a fraud you know and it's just gruel for uh, a is journalist it, that has it, to is it more gruel for journalists it's too much gruel you cannot say no it's just like it's entering all the openings of the cage for the interns you know like there's gruel pouring in from every window like not just from the gruel slot no, no, from like through the bars from the window, the tiny sliver of sunlight that they see for a few hours every day. Oh, but, right, the slop tube. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like, what's the strategy of a BMM journalist? You can go after Ben Simmons. You can talk about Larry Bird. Check, check. All, <laughs> all the things like, have happened, like, right? There's nothing else I can do. I, we had, I just talked about Bird and Ben Simmons. Like maybe, maybe how Simmons and Embiid can't coexist. Uh, it's like uh, Mikhail. Should, it's like should I write about Jason Tatum? Yes, here I go. You okay, know, it's okay, like yeah, okay. Tatum, Tatum puff piece about how he's taking the leap. Hmm. Simmons needs a jumper. Larry Bird goat. Uh, what else we got? Ooh, Iverson bad. There was an article I saw that someone was trying to figure out what would have been with Len Bias. And I'm like, totally, that's an interesting thing. But it's the BMM trying to like, it's like we could have beaten Jordan. Jordan would have been ended with Reggie Lewis and Len Bias. I'm like, maybe, but we'll never know because tragedy happened, you know. And one of our One of our great Twitter followers, I apologize for not remembering the handle. They sent us a, a, a pull quote from Steinbrenner. And Steinbrenner was like the former owner of the Yankees many moons ago and was like, it's all Boston media. It's all Boston sports media. Even back then, this is not new. No. This has been oh, the M.O. Steinbrenner's for the, son. Yeah. For the elevation of Boston athletes. That's why we talk about Bill Russell being better than Wilt Chamberlain. It is literally Boston media mafia. Will it Chamberlain is, was so yeah. much better than Bill Russell. It's just yeah. a joke. And yeah, it feels like the uh, media can make sidlers out of Larry Bird. You know, it's like, here's the top five players and Larry Bird. And they're like, ah, here's Larry Bird again. It's like, who is the the most promising young player in the NBA? It's like, these five players and Jason uh, Tatum. Tatum. T- T- Tatum's there, right? Yeah, Tatum. We got it. Yeah, I can't forget Tatum. Yeah. He's in the conversation. It's like whoever put, oh, the boss like, tones. Oh, yeah, great, great band, great band. Boston, oh, House <laughs> yeah. of Pain. Yeah, absolutely, best rappers of all time. Danny Boy, incredible. Rounders rewatch pod, you know, and I think um, you know it's like the Theophilus London thing. And it's like, ladies and gentlemen, here's this thing we're trying to push, and like right now it's happening on in entertainment with John Krasinski. It's like, why is John Krasinski all over my feed? He's okay, but I don't know why he's everywhere now, you know? He's totally, totally the Celtics of actors. He is the Celtics Not even Wahlberg. Of <laughs> it's Krasinski. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's just like, yes, yeah, celebrity fun stuff and John Krasinski again. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> it's a way to do this. And um, yeah, with no Theophilus London, no Jason Tatum, no John Krasinski. It's a direct lineage, man. But you get how it works, right? 
if you're a Celtics fan, you're you're going to gravitate towards other Celtics fans and people who write about things that are of your interest. Oh, it's sure. not like we see a bunch of Nuggets fans, you know, spread across basketball media. Oh, everywhere. Another another Nuggets fan because yeah. there's no there's no primogeniture. There's no there's no passing of the torch from Denver fan to Denver fan until they're occupying all the seats of power. I mean, no, Mike Wilbon. No, no. Mike Wilbon is made his name uh, as a Jordan beat guy, and you know afterwards went to do a talk show about the whole sports world, and that's why we don't have any good like personalities in New York, uh, because the Knicks there's nothing to talk about, and and in Boston as soon as they had Larry Bird they credit to them they kept it going right like where Wilbon kind of quit and joined ESPN. And Jackie McMullen's also part of the ESPN world, but the the journalists in Boston really kept Larry Bird alive, like a meme, and uh, they kept the idea of the Celtics in our zone, where we're forced to think about John Krasinski and Jason Tatum, where otherwise we would just let them float away, like the plot against America. I mean, there's no need to get into the whole BMM. We know it exists. We know what they're up it's to. It's fun. It's 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 cool. But <laughs> yeah. I did not think the story about Ben Simmons was negative. It just it it just relied on the idea that him not shooting threes is a problem yeah. and went from there. And I find that completely and obviously untrue. Like completely yeah. and obviously untrue. He definitely does not need to shoot threes. He doesn't. You can look at his numbers. He does not need to shoot threes. And all these nonsensical arguments about, like, well, if he took two a game and shot 30%, it would keep the defense sincere. No, no, it wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, it would not. It doesn't. Look at non-shooters. They can't create gravity on the perimeter. It does not work. And we the idea don't that he would be- just get, keep getting better. We don't know that. Look, look at Giannis, man. Look at Giannis. Over the last 20-some games of this season, he shot 25% from three. All that talk about Giannis is good from three now. No, he's not. If you take away his teams against the relegated, his games against the relegated Knicks, he shot like 29% from three. I mean, he just started that, a little hot and had a couple of big games. He can't why, shoot. And he's basically been the same shitty shooter from three for the last four years. He goes like 25%, 27, 31, 25, 27. This is who he's been. He's not better at shooting threes, despite practicing them, despite taking a bunch of them. He still is terrible at taking threes. There's no guarantee that Ben Simmons would start out being like a 15% shooter, then a 25% shooter, then a 35, and now he's a 40% shooter. That's not how things work. And I was trying to cut you off there because (laughs) because we have – crunch these numbers so much where it's to a point where it's like these are just big facts and I think where I was going with the BMM is there's a reason behind it and like I don't think Ben Simmons has anything to prove on the court we know what Giannis is like we could just show this thing to people like the Will Smith meme you know like here is the proof that Ben Simmons is not only fantastic, that the thing that you're fighting isn't really a thing. But then why are people fighting it? And I think the more interesting discussion with Ben Simmons is like, there's a multitude of things that he is that upsets many people. And those are the people who love The Last Dance. And those are the people who maybe think about Casey Jones and Tommy Heinsohn and Bill Russell and that's fair and this is like uh, that is an interesting discussion because like like your previous point he did it Ben Simmons proved that everyone was wrong about his shot yeah I don't know why we're relitigating this exactly. like it's over he, yeah. he, he yeah. refused to acquiesce to that nonsense and turned himself into a top 10 player this year yeah. Like I'm not saying he is a top 15, top 10 player in the NBA, but without Curry and without Durant, he was borderline top 10 this season. I yeah, would say I thought overall, he should have been a starter. I would say overall, he's maybe he's about 15. I would put him in yeah. that category. But this season, because of injuries, and you know, even Embiid, like Embiid missed a lot of time. Simmons was better than him this year. He just played more. I would say top 10 player. 
and he did not need to shoot threes, and he showed that. And that's despite a roster that was built as if intentionally devised to sabotage him. He's such a cool player. Not only does he not care about threes, he's still working on his free throw shot, yet his true shooting percentage is just elite because he does everything else. He just keeps on dunking the ball, you know? And it's ethical. It's, it's a really remarkable thing to see because he's just like rearranging pieces, but overall what you get is a top 15 player. And I think that's what my actual complaint is about the Jackie McMullen article is that it's fixated on something that isn't that important and has been well documented. What hasn't been well documented is how good he is now that yeah, he's become a, more a fantastic story. player, like yeah. a top 10 player this season yeah. without being able to shoot with a poorly constructed roster. And like, he's interesting mm-hmm. and that's, that's like lame. Yeah. Like, why not talk about what he does? Well, Again, I did not read every part of this article, but he created more threes off of assists than any player in the NBA. Yeah. Like, like that's crazy. Yeah, that him being on the court for your team is an advantage. <laughs> anyway, it's, he's he's awesome. Just one one interesting note about ESPN, the worldwide leader, as it's called. I'm a fan. Um, one of the founders, uh, Bill Rasmussen, he's a mm-hmm. Chicago native. This is from the Wikipedia page. His career in media began in Amherst, Massachusetts. Then he uh, went to Springfield, Massachusetts, spent eight years as sports director and news director. He then joined the New England Whalers as the communications director, and then he founded ESPN. I mean, Bristol's not far from no, the it's land not. of leprechauns. It, sir, it sure is not. But there is, there is your origin, literally. A New England media guy founded ESPN. And yet. I thought we were just making this shit up. He's given the reins over to the CMM for a, for a, brief, for a brief moment before games begin again. He's from Chicago. Hey, don't you think they should do the lottery now? That's something they can do that won't affect anything. Shouldn't they just, like, do the cards and the ping pong balls so we can mock draft? I know I like mock drafting and. That's a weird thing. That's a kink. But um, it didn't. It wouldn't affect anything. They could do the lottery and have us all watch, right? Well, that's uh, uh, presuming they've decided they're they're just going to jump straight to the playoffs. I mean, I kind of. That's. Oof. Can you imagine? But, but also, them not? also, if I'm them, if I'm the NBA, I'm not doing anything. Just just chill out, because if they can start the playoffs in like June or something. You know, like I'm not saying that's feasible, but if you could start the playoffs in June, maybe you make the first round five games, less time between them, you can kind of get back on your schedule and only be behind by about a month. Yeah. You know, like you can you can shorten things up, and then kind of just have your regular off season. This may change if they have to come back in September, but if you can yeah. pack the whole playoffs into June and July, you're kind of back on schedule. Yeah. Do we, do you care about crowning a champion this year? Yes. Hmm. That's fair. That's fair. I just think you have to. I I think, I I think it's mandatory. Mm. And I I just don't think it, because if whenever you come back, you can just finish this and then start over again. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you again. I mean, if you can't play for like a full year after this, then you might say, all right, we missed a year. There's no, you know, 2001 season in this speculative idea. But I think whenever you're like, all right, it's time to go. Let's just start with the playoffs. Yeah. That's what I would do. Knock it out. Mm-hmm. Because you get down to four teams really quick. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to worry about 30 teams and people moving around and full schedules. You can get down to a handful of, a handful of teams. You can put them all in one location even if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, as a fan, I would love to see it. And, you know, I don't have an investment. I'm not a, a Lakers fan. I'm not a Sixers fan. I'm not Bucks Nation. And I would I would want to see my team give it a shot. I'm just really worried about, like, safety, you know? And uh, I think <laughs> being a Knicks fan has turned me into, like, a, a, a 
a nihilist light, but I'm like, this thing that's happening outside of our window is bigger than basketball, but like, it just seems too dangerous to me. Um, and even if we have all these guys in the same room on an island, um, off the coast of wherever, uh, sequestered, and the scientists come out and say like, oh, we know more about this now, so like, it lives on your clothes, you know, whatever. It's more dangerous than we thought. And one of these guys gets sick. I'm like, we've made a big mistake, right? I mean, you know, the NBA is more visible than anyone. And they've inadvertently become kind of the sports face of coronavirus. So from a PR standpoint, it's different from them than even like baseball. Mm -hmm. Major League Baseball said, we're going to play. And someone gets it, you're like, ooh, bad move. But if the NBA does it, it's like, oh, you guys are idiots. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You shut it down on national TV because of corona. Now you're back out there, like, go bears breathing and stuff. <laughs> and shedding. <laughs> like, didn't you learn? Like, dude, we tried to come back. and like, yeah. Yeah, look, at, look at Rudy. Look at him. He's yeah. shedding again. Yeah. I'm into maybe starting, like, in the fall and just, like, rearranging next year a little bit, shortening the season. We can have two asterisks. This is an unprecedented event on Earth. So if the 2020 champion had a little asterisk next to them and the 21, 2021 champion did as well, whatever. <laughs> I don't <laughs> you know? think you even get an asterisk for this season. I mean, it, uh, yeah, the shortened season don't. I played like, 65 games. I know. This was um, not some half season. This was, this was more than they did in, in some of the lockout seasons. Not an asterisk. 65 games is enough. Oh, I'm all for asterisks, though, like a shortened three-point line. I think uh, the more information, the, the better. I don't fault. Uh, the, if the Lakers win, they deserve it even more, maybe. Maybe the asterisk is like, you guys went through some shit, and that it's even harder what you did this year than oh, any other year. I think shortened three-point line, no three-point line, no black players. There are certainly reasons for asterisks. Mm. I just don't see having 65 games instead of 82 being a, a reason for one to say, yeah, but that season, like, who cares? There is there is no real difference between 62, 65 and 82 games leading into a playoff series. Like, the playoffs is still the same. You still I, got past the All-Star break. I'm done with the regular season. Um, but I, same. <laughs> I think what I'm talking about is, like, some players got healthy and – some players don't have access to basketball stuff currently, and we heard oh, Jimmy. Yeah. That's true. J Jimmy Butler bought everyone hoops, and half his team don't have a place to put it, <laughs> you know, because they live in condos. And he's like, "What am I going to do with this amazing NBA hoop? Put it in the parking lot? I can't go out there." Um, I mean, and, I mean, th that kind of stuff is true. I, I just feel like that's so like on a. I just don't feel like that even warrants like an asterisk. But who cares? This is all just. It's a weird time, man. And, like, there's no home court advantage because there's no, there's no fans that we know influence refs, you know? And it's just a weird thing that we have to be like, what happened when uh, AD won his only championship? It's like, oh, that was a corona year. Be like, oh, noted. What a weird year, you know? Um, I agree. But hopefully they'll get us sorted. I, I want to watch some basketball. You know, oh, the, yeah, the last dance yeah. is not is not enough. I I love yeah, I agree. I love any kids. any basketball would be wonderful. Cookies. Cookies. Cookies.